everyone, Ben the Bar Guy back with another video to help you make better drinks and today we're going to talk about whiskey, specifically what makes it valuable. What are the characteristics and aspects of whiskey that make it worth money and why you should maybe keep some of the great whiskeys in your cellar for a few years and maybe they're worth more down the line. So let's make better drinks. All right, everyone, this is a video about whiskey. What makes bottles of whiskey valuable and what are some of the characteristics and aspects that bring value to whiskey? It's by no means a comprehensive list. I hope to one day have a whiskey buying specialist in here to talk to you guys and we'll interview them. It's a direction I want the channel to go is bringing in other people, but I'm currently surrounded by some of the rare and vintage whiskey that Reliable Tavern has, which is awesome. So let's get into it. Some of the aspects and characteristics that make valuable whiskey, number one, is obviously the king of all. It is taste. A whiskey can have all of the accoutrement and characteristics it wants, uh, but if it doesn't taste good and people don't like it, it will never do very well in terms of cost because people just won't want it. You know, this really has more to do with demand. A lot of times whiskeys do good in tasting festivals or spirits competitions. Happy Van Winkle was famous for in the early 2000s, finishing very, very high in some spirits competitions, and that launched its popularity uh, of late a lot of Heaven Hill products have done very, very well. So when you do well at spirits competitions, oftentimes your bottles will skyrocket in price right off the bat. Uh, a lot of these spirit competitions are blind. They're putting these spirits up against not only their own category of American whiskey or bourbon, but they're also being put up against some of the world's finest products. And so taste is obviously going to be one of the number one defining characteristics of any value on a bottle of whiskey. Okay, the second characteristic that you'll find that really puts value on whiskey is the age of the bottle. And I don't mean vintage. Age refers to the time that the whiskey spent in barrel. So for instance, we have a bottle of Heaven Hills Old Fitzgerald, uh, a relatively new release, but it's 14 years of age on the bottle. And so that 14 represents how many years it spent in barrel. It has nothing to do with how long it's been in the bottle. A different example would be this Old Crow. Old Crow is a brand currently owned by the Jim Beam Distillery. This is a 1970s Old Crow, made it the Old Castle Distillery, is seven year old bourbon. In other words, that spent seven years in a barrel, but its vintage is 1972. So this whiskey is old in the sense that it was made a long time ago. It is not old in the sense of barrel. So just keep that in mind. When you're talking about age, you're talking about how long something spent in the barrel, not how old the bottle is. Now, why does that matter? It's not always a one-to-one -one connection connection with age to um, to value. For instance, this Happy Van Winkle 12 year is far more expensive than this 14 year old Fitzgerald. So even though the Fitzgerald has been aged two years longer, that doesn't necessarily mean it's more expensive. However, generally speaking, a little more age on whiskey does bring up its value. Typically, you will not see American whiskey, particularly bourbon, aged exceptionally long periods like in Scotland, where they can age things 30, 40, 50 years. There's a reason for that. In Scotland, the climate is very different and therefore aging in the barrel is very different. Also, American whiskeys like bourbon are aged in new American oak. As you can imagine, a brand new barrel is going to impart a lot of flavor on the whiskey. So it doesn't need to spend as long in the barrel. Combine that with the hot summers and a continental climate in the middle of the United States and then very cold winters, uh, you get an aging process that just doesn't need quite as long in the barrel. In addition, in the old days, they actually actually thought that whiskey aged too long was uh, decreasing the value of the whiskey. They actually thought that old whiskey was no good. And so they spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get rid of their old whiskey, as we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the third thing that makes whiskey valuable, and it's vintage. That's when it was made. Particularly if and when a whiskey was made at a time period where maybe the distillery doesn't exist anymore, or perhaps the brand has changed later 
label, or perhaps it was made by someone else altogether. I'll give you a for instance. This is an excellent whiskey made by the Sazerac Company at Buffalo Trace. It is called Eagle Rare Tenure. They also have an expression that we don't have here in their antique collection that is, is 17 years old, while this is 10 years old here. But I have an Eagle Rare bottle at home from the 1990s or early 2000s that was actually made by Seagram's. Seagram's owned the label Eagle Rare back then and put it in a liter bottle, which is very rare. Now everything's in 750 milliliter bottles. It has that plastic cap that you're familiar with that Seagram's always put, that gold plastic caps on their uh, bottles. It's at 100 proof and not 90, like the Eagle Rare here. And so that bottle, because it was made at a Seagram's distillery and not Buffalo Trace, has value because we'll never see that again. Also, the vintage can have an effect on the price because of what was happening in the whiskey market at the time. A good example is the 1970s. In the 1970s, vodka became more popular in the American drinking market. Because of that, there was what's called a whiskey glut, where there was just too much whiskey and not enough being drank. Whiskey began to get a little older, sitting in warehouses a lot longer than was originally expected because people just weren't drinking it. And so bottles such as this, Old Crow from the 70s, end up being far more valuable because as these the whiskey glut forced barrels to age longer than expected, they got worried that their whiskey would become no longer good. In other words, age too long. Now these days, we don't mind a whiskey age too long. For instance, this is a 23 year old Pappy Van Winkle. It's very, very old. So these days we actually kind of prefer older whiskeys, but whiskey makers back then, especially in bourbon, thought that old whiskey was bad whiskey. And so what they started to do was take their seven and eight and nine year whiskeys and put them into their standard issue regular bourbon, straight Kentucky bourbon bottles. So 1970s, for instance, Old Taylor or Old Crow is gonna be a, a lot better whiskey, a lot better tasting whiskey, just because of what was happening in the whiskey market and they were moving their older reserves, their older barrels in the younger bottles. This happens to be another way they sold whiskey during the time period. They would put them in beautiful decanters or clever decanters and sell them that way and that became something of a fad. So if you hunt those down, that can raise the value of a bottle of whiskey. Another example of a time period whiskey that really had a lot of value was a whiskey made by American Medicinal Spirits. And it was made in 1917, right before Prohibition. It was in kept in government warehouses, bonded warehouses for the duration of the 15 years or so of Prohibition, at which point they were given a medicinal license to sell the whiskey. At that point, it was 15 years old and it was bottled in 1932. These particular bottles were kept in a basement of, an, of a Georgetown row house for some time where they were discovered and then sold. The cool thing about the whiskey is that it survived prohibition and it was 15 years old at a time period where whiskey would not have been aged that way. Prohibition actually forced it to age that way. And so I can only imagine some of the great whiskeys that prohibition created solely because there was nothing to do with them. And so in the early 1930s, the whiskey market must have been crazy good because of all of the whiskey that was now allowed to flow out of government warehouses. It was an honor to have tasted such a whiskey. Uh, just so you know, whiskey that old kind of gets mushroomy and weird, but this particular whiskey, that all kind of blew off after a while and it was amazing. Another reason that whiskey can become expensive is because of the distillery that makes it. That distillery may go away. And during periods of whiskey lulls where people aren't buying as much whiskey in the market, a lot of whiskey disappears. Uh, you guys may be familiar with Pappy Van Winkle, but what you may not know is that the whiskey that was aging in the 90s really was a result of the last whiskey that was made at Stitzel Weller Distillery. Stitzel Weller closed in the early 90s, and when it closed, there was no longer a place that made this tremendously delicious weeded whiskey. And whatever had been made and was stored, they just kept aging it for a long time. They then started making their whiskey at the Sazerac Company's Buffalo Trace Distillery in Frankfurt. That's where these whiskeys were made. People really enjoy what's made at Buffalo Trace. What made Pappy famous in the first place was the Stitzel Weller 
Miller Distillery. Also, the locations of distilleries can add value to a whiskey. Places like Maryland, Eastern Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, if you can find whiskeys that were made in those locations, which isn't as done as much today, can add a lot of value to a whiskey. Another example is defunct distillery called the Old Castle, where Old Crow was made. Old Crow and Old Taylor from that time period, the 70s, uh, those whiskeys were renowned for being delicious, but the, but the distillery just didn't survive and ended up closing its doors. That's yet another example of a closed distillery creating value in your whiskey. We've already briefly mentioned this, but the next way that whiskey gains value is just by popular brands in general. If people recognize the brand or the name, they're gonna buy it. Bourbon in particular was known for, for a lot of non-distilling producers who understood that if they made a deal with a distillery that produced a decent whiskey, they could put their own label on it and it would sell and gain confidence in the market. People would trust that label. But distilleries often made the same juice for lots and lots of different labels. So the Stitzel Weller Distillery made all the Pappy Van Winkle products, all the old Fitzgerald products. Buffalo Trace makes a lot of products. But back in the day, you could also be a non-distilling producer. You could just be an individual like Pappy Van Winkle who would go to a distillery like Stitzel Weller and make a deal for them to make his whiskey. He liked Stitzel Weller because they made great weeded bourbons and had a great weeded mash bill and he knew that would be popular. So a lot of these labels gain massive popularity but those can be from people who don't even make the whiskey themselves. That's more typical of bourbon than it is in something like scotch where every distillery has their label. But in essence, if the market believes in a whiskey and believes it's good, it will go up in value. The next thing that can really boost a whiskey's value is its proof. Typically speaking, whiskey will do better at higher proofs in terms of being sipping whiskey and premium brands will tend to raise their proof. The reason is that it simply maintains more flavor to not be watered down. And of course, if you'd like to water it down at home, you can, but then you've made more whiskey itself. If you buy a 750 liter of George T. Stagg at 129, but you add water to it every time you drink it, you've actually bought much more George T. Stagg if that's how you like it. So having a higher proof on the whiskey usually will raise its value in terms of desire in the market, but there are also premium brands that don't even water their whiskey down at all. George T. Stagg is famously barrel proof and is at this particular year, which I think was 2018, was 129.7 proof. Another thing that can really jump up the value of a whiskey is just having a great story. There is a label from Colonel E.H. Taylor, but has a similar looking label, except it says Tornado Survivor. And that's pretty interesting, right? It had survived a tornado that had ripped apart the rick house that these barrels had been aged in. During the repair of the rick house, in which animals could crawl in them or whatever, they just lived out there. But then when they went to taste this whiskey, it ended up being delicious. So they ended up bottling it up and calling it Tornado Survivor. And now if you have one of those bottles, it's very, very expensive because of the cool story. So the story behind a whiskey can often be so cool that people will love to have it. Another thing that can really raise the value of a whiskey is its mash bill. What do I mean by mash bill? Well, that's basically its recipe. What grains were used in the process of making the whiskey. Now, if it happens to be a bourbon, then it has to be at least 51% corn, but the rest of the mash bill, the rest of the 49%, if it was made with 51, can be made with wheat, rice, and barley, usually to start the distillation. One of the booms in whiskey of late is the popularity of the Pappy Van Winkle line, which happens to be a weeded whiskey. There are very few weeded whiskeys out there. In fact, the Stitzel Weller Distillery is one of the very few making weeded whiskey when Pappy Van Winkle was buying whiskey from them and bottling it under his label. Weeded means that at least some part of the mash bill has wheat and usually just barley with it. They usually don't go together with rye as wheat and rye don't play well together in a bourbon but sometimes you will see four grain whiskeys, but weeded is just so rare and so tasty and easy to drink that people really enjoy the aromas and notes on weeded whiskeys. And so they tend to be pretty popular. The mash bill might also make a whiskey rare because working with something like rye and then aging it for a long time might be tough to do or even expensive. It's very hard to find older ryes. You may have noticed if you're a whiskey hunter out there, old rye is pretty tough to find. And typically it's because rye was tough 
tough to work with and whiskey makers preferred to not work with it if they could. And so instead of work with messy sticky rye, they just chose corn and made bourbons instead. So there wasn't as much rye made during the 90s and early 2000s as there was bourbon. Therefore, there's not as much aging rye uh, currently in the market. Combine that with a cocktail boom in the early 2000s using lots of, of rye that was young, you don't have age reserves of much rye. So because of that, there's not as much supply and rye that's old will tend to be much more expensive. Heck, at this point, rye that's not old is more expensive than bourbon. The last aspect that makes whiskey expensive is oftentimes just how much of it was made. If it's a scarce product or a runoff run or a release every year, it's gonna be worth more just because there wasn't as much made. So a good example would be High West Midwinter's Night's Dram. A delicious whiskey they release in the fall of every year. They've also been known for other releases like Boo Rye and other blends that they make out there in, in Utah. But those type releases are rare because they just don't come out that often. Another example would be the Antique Collection from Buffalo Trace, all of which are different whiskeys, but they're only released once a year and they're very hard to get. Another interesting example would be this Colonel E.H. Taylor Amaranth. I told you about the Tornado Survivor E.H. Taylor, but the Amaranth is a unique grain called the Grain of the Gods, and it's something of a unique grain to use for whiskey. And so this whiskey shot up in value simply because it was tasty, number one, and there wasn't much of it. And also the grain itself made for an interesting, uh, noteworthy whiskey. And so when something is made in scarce quantities and is hard to get or may never be made again, typically it will go up in value. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that video on what makes whiskey valuable. If you guys are going out and buying things let me know in the comments what you what you're after or what you've bought that was a good buy and exploded in value don't think this list is by any means comprehensive i'm sure there's many more things that make whiskey valuable but those are some of the main ones i hope i explained it well and i hope when you're looking at bottles out there in the future you can see some of the reasons that things go up in price as always guys thank you very much for being a part of the channel to better drinks we'll see you soon hey everyone thanks for watching ben the bar guy videos and if you want to keep the videos coming maybe hit me with a subscribe over there or click on one of these videos over here, all of which will keep this bar craft going into posterity. Till next time, Nux Beer Mug Daiquiri.